going to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65, we're getting close to the end. Um, Mark tells me that he covered uh, 63 and 64 last week, so um, it's good. That probably would have taken uh, longer if we had had a teacher here who dragged his feet like I did, but uh, Mark got through it all, so... Um, but in chapter, I've kind of put up on the board an outline of this overall section just to kind of keep our minds in where we're at right now. Um, of course, you know, chapter 63 begins with this picture of this lone divine warrior who treads the wine press of, uh, and, you know, all the different things you could talk, you, there's a lot of things you could say about that. Uh, but from verses set, verse 7 of chapter 63 all the way to the end of chapter 64, is pretty much dominated by this uh, song or prayer that the people give, a prayer of confession. They start out by recounting their history, and they eventually get to uh, questioning, well, God, where's all those actions you did for us in the past? You did all these great things for us before, Lord. Why aren't you doing them anymore? Well, you know, it's not hard to figure out. That the reason that the people are in such a mess is because of their sins. And so this uh, basic appeal now to God as a father is uh, they beg forgiveness and they ask God to save them. They point out the fact that in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 64, our holy and beautiful house where our fathers praised you has been burned by fire and all our precious things have become a ruin. Will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us beyond measure? And it is on that note that we come now to chapter 65. And the beginning of chapter 65 is God's response to that prayer. Um, verses 1 through 7. I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I, to a nation which did not call on my name. I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts. A people who continually provoke me to my face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on bricks, who sit among graves and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh and the broth of un clean meat is in their pots who say keep to yourself do not come near to me for I am holier than you these are smoke in my nostrils a fire that burns all the day behold it is written before me I will not keep silent but I will repay I will even repay into their bosom both their own iniquities and the iniquities of their fathers together says the Lord because they have burned incense on the mountains and scorned me on the hills, therefore I will measure their former work into their bosom. Now, how does that respond to what we see in chapter 63 and 64, that prayer there? How does that answer all the concerns of the people? Jenna. Yeah, basically, yeah, you know, who's the one with the problem here? Is it God? No, it's the people. I mean, you know, you look at chapter 64 and verse 7 talks about uh, how, you know, there is no one who calls on your name, who arouses himself to take hold of you. Which, I mean, that's true. And then God points that, yeah, God agrees with that in chapter 65 and verse 1. He said, yeah, I said, here am I, here am I, to a nation which did not call on my name. Uh, you know, he describes them as a rebellious people grieving his Holy Spirit in verse 10 of chapter 63. And in verse 2 of chapter 65, he says, I spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good. Um, and, you know, you could probably point to a couple of other things here. You know, is God going to save his people? Yes? No? Righteous. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He's going to save his people on his own terms. Okay. But, you know, not. Now, there is an interesting thing I want to point out here in the way this passage is used in the New Testament. Okay. You know, go to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 65. Look at this for a second. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not ask for me. 
I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I, to a nation which did not call on my name. I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts. Now, throughout verses 1 and 2, does he appear to be talking about the same group of people throughout? No. Huh? You're not, you're not supposed to spoil the answer, Keith. Uh, <laughs> if we didn't know what Ro if we didn't know what Paul said in Romans, would we? What what would we? <laughs> Hi, Jenna. You thought he was talking about Israel throughout, right? I think it looks that way when you're reading Isaiah 65 by itself. But you go to Romans chapter 10, and what happens? You know, go to Romans chapter 10. Paul quotes this passage there. <gasps> Prophecy with dual fulfillment? What? God chose the Israelite nation. They work. Right. Okay, now in Isaiah, oh, excuse me, in Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. Uh, Okay, Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? Well, first Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. He's quoting from the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 there. And, verse 20, Isaiah is very bold when he says, I was found by those who did not seek me, and I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. He's quoting verse 1 of Isaiah 65 there. It's pretty clear from the context of Romans 9 and 10 that he's applying this passage to the Gentiles. They're the people that did not know God. They're the people that had not called on Him. And yet God permitted Himself to be found by them. But, as for Israel, he says, verse 21, All the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. So Paul reads it and says, Oh, there we got two groups of people here. Kind of interesting how... It's kind of interesting how the New Testament takes that Old Testament passage and uses it in a different way. And, you know, if you were a Jew in the first century, you might have gone, No, Paul, that was talking about us the whole time. Paul says, No, it's not. No, there's a Gentile inclusion element going on here. Uh, there's, a, there's a form of contrast. And But let me ask you another question. By the time you get done reading Romans 9, 10, and 11, is there really a distinction between Jew and Gentile? No, not really. I mean, and I think that that's, it's kind of, I think that Paul's kind of making a rhetorical point about that here, that really God had a plan all along to have Israel, and that Israel was going to be the remnant of, you know, the Jews, but also the Gentiles who were grafted into the people of God, become part of his people. And we're going to see this more pointedly in chapter 66, but it's being hinted at here now. Um, it's a, that, that, that was just one thing I thought was kind of interesting, the way he used that passage in the New Testament. Any comments or questions on that? Or? Um, we could look at a couple of other things here in Isaiah 65. We've got people burning incense on bricks and sitting in graves and eating swine flesh or pig skin or however you read that. Uh, you know, what, what do all these things have in common? Hmm? They're unclean. You know, they're not things that they should be doing. They're pagan practices, basically. Uh, but what's ironic is in verse 5, all these unclean things they're doing, and then what do they go and claim? I'm sorry? Yeah, verse five, Isaiah 65, verse 5. They go and do all these unclean things and they say, but we're holier than you. You see anything a little incongruous about that? A little weird? This is like the one time in the Bible where the expression holier than thou appears. I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's... I don't know that that's so weird. But what I think supporting a baby Oh, you need to be hung Somebody was reading Doy Moyer today. Um, <laughs> no, the uh, 
No, I, I mean, there's a problem with that. You know, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Uh, but really what we have here is this, this problem. You know, people, people who say, oh, I'm holier than you. They are smoke in God's nostrils. There is a perversion going on here. A people who say, evil is good and good is evil. Isaiah 5, 20 and 21 talks about that. You know, they, they've substituted light for darkness and darkness for light. They've taken what is unclean, lived a life of uncleanness, and then come and said, I'm holier than you. It's this people who are supposed to be called by the name of the Lord, worshiping in the temple, but all the while worshiping their false gods. It's total hypocrisy. People have not changed. This is still true today. Uh, you know, this is the kind of statements that religious people would make. You know, I'm holier than you. All the while going and living a life of uncleanness. Well, you gotta be, you gotta be careful. Be careful about thinking that you're holier than other people. Uh, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, in verse 7, yes. No, I meant religious people, you know. Yeah. Now, one of, one of the, the key elements of being a royal priesthood and a holy nation is that we proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Um, you know, this whole idea that you know, we're supposed to be a holy people. Well, the truth is that you know, it's only when we acknowledge that we in and of ourselves are not capable of being holy that God can purify us. Like Isaiah in chapter 6, you know, he sees God, holy, exalted, the cherubim and the seraphim everywhere, and he's, what is his, his response? Not, oh, I, I feel so holy, I'm in the presence of this holy God. No, woe is me, because I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. I'm not worthy. That's the kind of attitude that we need to have as well. You know, the idea of Isaiah, uh, that Isaiah had, just glimpsing the glory of God, gives him the perspective on both how awesome God is and how unworthy he is. And that's the kind of perspective that we need to have as well. Um, okay, you know, and there's just other things, there's other things we could say. Anybody have any comments down to verse 7? Verse 8. Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for there is no benefit in it, so I will act on behalf of my servants, in order not to destroy all of them. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob, and an heir of my mountains from Judah. Even my chosen one shall inherit it, and my servants will dwell there. Sharon will be a pasture than for flocks, and the valley of Achor a resting place for herds. For my people who seek me, but you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune, and fill cups with wine mixed for destiny, I will destine you for the sword, and all of you will bow down to the slaughter, because I called, but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not hear, and you did evil in my sight, and chose that in which I did not delight. Right. So, God's still responding to their prayer here. Uh, what? Uh, at this point, he kind of dichotomizes uh, two groups of people. Um, but, what, one thing, I guess, again, there's any number of points we can make. One thing I think is interesting is in verse 10, he talks about Sharon being a pasture land for flocks in the valley of Achor, a resting place for herds. Uh, we don't know a lot about Sharon, but what do we know about the valley of Achor? Hmm? Valley of Achor. It's a play on Achan's name in Joshua chapter 7. Um, the word Achor, what does it mean? Anybody know? Trouble him. Yeah. You know, before, before, before he's executed, uh, it, it's kind of funny how Achan's name is a word play on that. You know, before he's executed, Joshua says, you've troubled Israel, the Lord will trouble you this day. And they stone him and they name it 
the valley of trouble. But here, verse 10, we kind of have this reversal. The valley of Achor is a resting place for herds instead for my people who seek me. So there's this pleasant thing going on. Uh, in verse 8 and in verse 9, God talks about acting on behalf of His who? What group of people is God going to help? His servants. Have we seen servants before anywhere in Isaiah? Besides a bunch of times. Um, I, think, I mean, sometimes the servant of the Lord is the nation of Israel collectively. And sometimes it refers to this messianic servant figure. And Isaiah 53 is probably a passage that you know, we'd be most familiar with in that context. I think it's interesting that after Isaiah 53, it's never the singular servant. It's always the plural, the plural servants after that point. And the nation is no longer, the nation collectively is no longer addressed as servant, but rather those people within the nation. And so God says, I will act on behalf of my servants. My servants will dwell there, but now there's a group that's opposite of the servants. Who is it? Okay? People who forget God. People who forsake the Lord. People who, uh, people who have a feast for fortune and destiny. You know, fortune and destiny, the kind of pagan gods, the fates and whatnot. There is a word play here, and it came across in my English version, actually. You fill cups with wine mixed for destiny. I'm going to destine you for the sword. Uh, so that, but that's a word play in Hebrew as well as English. Um, and then we get to verse 13. The Lord continues this contrast between these two groups. Those, you who forsake the Lord versus the servants of the Lord. Verse 13, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servants will eat, but you will be hungry. Behold, my servants will drink, but you will be thirsty. Behold, my servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. Behold, my servants will shout joyfully with a glad heart, but you will cry with a heavy heart, and you will wail with a broken spirit. You will leave your name for a curse to my chosen ones, and the Lord God will slay you. But my servants will be called by another name, because he who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth. He who swears in the earth will swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hidden from my sight. Hmm. So here we are. The, the servants, well, the servers, and the forsakers. Uh, actually, in Isaiah 66, it's the servants and the enemies, uh, when you get down to Isaiah 66, 14. Uh, you know, but what would you say, you know, what's the kind of the contrast here that he's making? What, 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 what's the point of these, these statements that he makes in verses 13 and following? Yeah, no. This is kind of a you versus them. There's only two groups of people. There's a group of people that are, God's, that are serving God, and there's a group of people that are not serving God. That's really how it kind of dichotomizes itself. Uh, and which team do you want to be on by reading this? It's pretty obvious. Do we see anything like any statements like this in the New Testament anywhere? Not exactly in this form, but you know, this reminded me of something that's kind of prominent in the New Testament. Uh, parting the sheep and the goats. Okay, um, I hadn't thought of that, but that's one one instance of that kind of thing. My sir. <laughs> You know, I hadn't thought of that, but that's a really cool point. I, um, I, I I'm gonna, I gotta think about that some. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't what I was thinking of, but I like that, yeah, Jenna. So basically, kind of the principle of whoever has to him more shall be given, and you know, even when he does not, if whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. Not what I was thinking of, but again, I can see how you know you can make that connection. This idea is all over the New Testament, isn't it? <laughs> uh, people, are, everybody's like, oh yeah, I know what that is, and they all think of a different story. That's cool, right there. Um, what I thought of when I read it was this is kind of like what Jesus says in the in the Sermon on the Plain in Luke six, isn't it? 
You know, he talks about, blessed are you who hunger. Why? Because you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who mourn. Why? Because then you will rejoice. Then he turns around and says, woe to you who are full now, because you will be hungry. Woe to you who are rejoicing now, because you will mourn. And so he says there's this reversal coming in which people who are currently either mourning or rejoicing are going to sort of switch roles. You know, he, you kind of get this idea, maybe in the background, he's tapping into this thing in Isaiah 65. My servants are going to be the ones who eat, and the rest of you are going to be hungry. Well, currently it doesn't look that way, does it? Currently it looks like, it doesn't look like God's team is the one that's prospering. It doesn't look like God's team is the one that's winning. You might be prompted to ask the question, Lord, when are you going to fix this? Jesus promises that it will be fixed. Woe, woe to you who are on the wrong side now. You may think you're living it up and living it large, but that's not how it's going to work. <laughs> hmm. When guys get oppressed at the beginning, that People are plagiarizing the Bible. Plagiarizing. What do we do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, most stories that are told... I mean, that, that is the story of the Bible in a nutshell is... I mean, that's the problem of suffering when you think about it. You know, it does it always look like things are going well? Does I mean, look at the world around you now. Does it, things look like they're working out? That people are getting what they deserve? No. Yes. No. Mm. Hey, speaking of stuff that's in Revelation, let's let's look let's look ahead even further. You know, I mean, because you know, we're we're looking at all these questions about you know how can this world, this corrupt world, be associated with this God of truth? How can a how can a creation that has been so cursed by sin be restored to God? How's it gonna, how are they going to do it? We'll make another one. <laughs> There you go. Verse 17. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people, and there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the voice of crying. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days, for the youth will die at the age of 100." And the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For so as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the day of, of my people. My chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, but they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord, and their descendants with them. It will also come to pass... That before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and the dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Yes. Well, yeah, Revelation is definitely quoting this passage here. Uh, this idea of the new heavens and a new earth. Well, why is that significant? New heavens, new earth. Got a throwback to anything? <laughs> yes, Jenna? Oh, what was your question? There is a definite allusion to uh, Genesis 3.14 in verse 25 of this chapter. He's kind of, I mean, I do think that Isaiah assumes a knowledge of Genesis when he's writing this. Because, you know, this idea of new heavens and a new earth. Well, you know, he's going back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. A new creation. You know, but he talks about this, the dust becoming the serpent's food. He's pointing to that, that promise. God hasn't forgotten about that promise he made. God hasn't forgotten about that curse that he placed on the serpent. You know, who made this mess in the first place. And God is going to right that wrong at some point. Uh, so that, that, that's part of the new creation, is fulfilling that final promise. Um, there's a lot of connections between you know, some of the stuff that's said here in Isaiah chapter 1 as well. In the very beginning of the book of Isaiah, 
Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth. The heavens and the earth are called as witnesses to the people's sins. But here God says, I create new heavens and a new earth. Um, you know, while the old heavens and the old earth you know, were witnesses of Israel's rebellion, here they become the facilitator of Israel's new life. There's a sort of returning to the ideal world, the pre-sin world. Eden, revisited, regained. Uh, the former things are will not be remembered. That's also quoted in Revelation 21 and verse 4. The new t Revelation, Revelation is not the only passage in the Bible that makes reference to the new heavens and the new earth, by the way. Anybody know of any others? Yes, Jenna. Okay, well, that, that's an example of the heavens and earth being paired together in the Bible um, and being called as witnesses in fact, I think Isaiah 1 is probably alluding to Deuteronomy 32. Uh, but I was thinking more along the New Testament. Does the New Testament ever talk about new heavens and new earth outside of Revelation? Yes, 2 Peter 3. Uh, 2 Peter 3, verse 13. But what happens right before he talks about that? What has to happen for there to be a new heavens and a new earth? The old one has to be destroyed, right? I mean, that's why in verse 10 of 2 Peter 3, he says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and all its works will be burned up. You know, destruction... You know, it's not planet earth that gets the fire, it's the whole universe that gets the fire. It's the heavens and the earth that is destroyed by fire here. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But, according to His promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Um, you also might think of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. The former things have passed away. Again, going back to Isaiah 65. Um, Romans 8, another good passage to go to, talking about how this creation is currently subjected to futility, but it will be set free from its slavery to corruption. Uh, now, when is this fulfilled? New heavens and new earth. And the day of the Lord. <laughs> okay, yeah. Is, now, there's a sense in which... You know, we're already participating in the new creation. As 2 Corinthians 5 indicates, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And then there's a sense in which it hasn't happened yet either. And we're kind of in this already not yet phase where we see the end result for what it is because we know who Christ is and we know that there's a life beyond this one that outweighs everything else. But then there's also a sense in which we're still waiting for the consummation of the ages. We're still waiting for God to come back and finish the new creation that he has started and so that's one thing that we're, we're looking forward to and hoping for. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff in this passage in Isaiah 65, by the way. Um, you know, a person lives to a hundred is thought accursed. What do we think of that? Verse 20. I know, today, if a person lives to be a hundred years old, what do you think of them? They, they use it. Yeah, they get a letter from the president. Yeah, I mean, you know, living to be a hundred is cool in today's world. Oh, yeah, they, they've lived a long, fruitful life. Isaiah says, "Person who lives a hundred in this new creation, he's not gonna. That's not a fruitful life. That's a waste." He says, "That's just small, frail. You know, one hundred years is short, pathetic, cursed life." And there's kind of this implied question: Why settle for that when you could have so much more? You know, I mean, you know, you, you create this hypothetical scenario. All oh, the best of both worlds. I live like a total sinner and do whatever I want for 100 years and repent at the last second. You've wasted 100 years is what you've done. Really? Because it's just so infinitesimally small and worthless on the scale, on the scale of eternity. Um, there's, I think in some ways it's kind of a throwback to Genesis as well, too, when you think about it. Because, you know, the first thing you read about in Genesis is all these people living 900 years, 800 years, 700 years. You know, people live long lifespans. 
Uh, now, it didn't have great results back then because sin had crept into the world. But imagine that without sin. You know, what could we do with that? A world without sin. A creation with righteousness dwelling in it. Uh, people, um, you know, I mean, you get all sorts of other things. There's kind of this idea throughout the text of an end to futility. You know, I mean, the worst thing that can happen is, you know, you do all this work, you build this house, you plant this vineyard, and somebody else lives in it, and somebody else eats it. Curses of the covenant. Unhappy things. Yes, Jen? Yeah, that's true. Um, that's kind of interesting. Now here it is, is, you know, they work and they get to eat the fruit of their work. Instead of being flesh being like the grass and the flower, which is here today and gone tomorrow, what does it say their life will be like? Verse 22, yeah. I like a tree. Trees live a lot longer. Trees live longer than humans sometimes. Um, some trees are hundreds, thousands of years old. You know, instead of like the flower or like the grass, your life is now like the tree. The chosen ones, he says in verse 22, actually wear out the work of their hand. You know, so uh, no longer bearing children or calamity. They no longer have to deal with this problem of parental sin and parents bringing sin into a parents bringing children into a messed up world because the messed up world's gone. It's been replaced by a better one. Uh, verse 24. And I'll point out a couple uh, the point that's being made here. Uh, the sentiment of that prayer of confession. There's kind of this implied comment throughout of, you know, God, we called on you and you haven't answered. And God retorts in verse 12 that I called. Well, verse 12 of chapter 65, God retorts and says, I called and you did not answer. So it's not me, it's you that has the communication problem. But in verse 24 of chapter 65, it says, I will come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Is this communication barrier that you've got between you and God is going to be broken and done away with. We will finally be able to talk and understand each other. Uh, the fact that, you know, because the fact is that sometimes we don't understand God. We don't presently see Him. Um, you know, we don't. That's one of the curses of sin. You know, how do you have a relationship with somebody that you've never met in person, never seen? Well, that problem, that barrier will be done away with. We will be like Him. We will see Him as He is. Uh, and finally, verse 25. Does that remind us of anything from earlier? Wolf and the lamb lie down together. The lion eats straw. Have we seen anything like that before? Yes, Jen? Okay, yeah, there was a comment about this in Isaiah chapter 11. Um... Isaiah 11 in verses 6 through 9. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. The young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. I mean, you got all these dangerous animals around, and you know children are playing with them and not fearing. The carnivores have become herbivores. The predators can live with the prey in peace. The lion is eating straw instead of killing antelope. Or, you know, whatever lions killed in the ancient Near East. But all these different things here. The, and the serpent eats dust, of course. You've got that little allusion to Genesis 3 there, which we already pointed out. There's something to be said about this. That while the present creation is hostile towards man, the new creation will not be. The new creation will be something that is favorable and better. Um, we could talk about more things in chapter 65. Does anybody have any other thoughts they want to share? There's a lot of cool stuff here. Oh, okay. We don't we probably don't have enough time to finish chapter 66 and do it give it the justice it deserves, but um, Maybe we can read some of it at least. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. All right. So... 
What would you say is the main point of that? God's making. All of these things belong to me. Oh, the their very existence. Mm hmm. All right. I mean, you know. It's important to realize, you know, I mean, just because we change chapters does not mean we're changing subjects. You know, God's talking about, I'm going to make new heavens and new earth, and by the way, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. There's that pairing of heaven and earth again. You know, I, Je yes, Jenna? Yes, yes, that's an important passage. It, Isaiah might actually be alluding to that, actually. In 1 Kings chapter 8, do you have the verse number on that? Uh, verse, yeah, 1 Kings 8, Solomon's prayer of dedication for the temple. You know, they built this glorious house. You know, the, Israel, never had, ne Israel was never really able to get Solomon's temple back. You know, they had a glorious temple in the days of Herod the Great. But, um, but Solomon's praying this prayer. You know, they got this temple that the interior walls are lined with gold. He says in verse 27, Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant, to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and to the prayer which your servant prays before you today. That your eyes may be open toward this house night and day, toward the place which you have said my name shall be there, to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray toward this place. And so they built this house for God to dwell in, but even while they're dedicating it, Solomon says, there's really no way this house can contain you, God. You're too big. <laughs> That's what, nothing he can do God. Right. In any way, God has given us everything. Exactly. So he's done it all for us. Yes, uh, that, that's a, a point here. You know, I mean, the Old Testament has several references describing the Ark of the Covenant as God's foot, footstool. Um, verse Chronicles 28, verse 2, for instance. But the temple is not God's footstool. The Ark of the Covenant is not His footstool. It's the whole earth that's His footstool, ultimately. I've heard, uh, oh, especially when I was in Florida College, had no hands but our hands. I, no, it's uh, God does not need your help. Don't ever delude yourself into thinking that God can get it done, or, or, that God can't get it done without you. God can get anything done without any of us. But He chooses to involve us in things. And for that, we owe Him thanks and praise and that, we, that He would use us as instruments or vessels for His glory. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time. Uh, we'll pick up and finish up the book of Isaiah next week, and that'll be the, uh, the end of a very long study. But... Yeah, I still don't like that song. Yeah, I still don't like that song. <laughs> nice try, though. <laughs>